social distancing, you say? The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Well, who wants to uh, start uh, the, the conversation? Sarah, Brian, Greg? Which, uh, which I always are? defer to Sarah. The Sarah, you, you, <laughs> you by, by default. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I suppose we'd better get the elephant out of the room first. Let, let's have the fight about what disinformation is. <laughs> uh, I, I think we should open with the what we're going to be covering. Oh, okay. And then go on, Jake. You do it. Yeah. Fine. Um, okay. So the the panel is called disinformation about disinformation, and uh, essentially what we want to do is we want to uh, broaden people's understanding of what disinformation is because it seems quite a lot of the attention these days is focused on things like uh, Twitter bots or Facebook pages. And there's really just a huge amount out there that is um, sort of much more important in terms of actually driving how people perceive the world. So we're going to be covering uh, how misinformation and disinformation are not a limited phenomenon exclusive to Russia or China, and that a huge amount of disinformation does not even touch social media, that it actually comes from uh, authorities, celebrities, and the media. So and corporations we'll start up and, and corporations. So we, we will start out by uh, beating up on Brian about the uh, definition of misinformation. <laughs> Sorry, w welcome so, to our virtual sitting room where we, we just have a chat about things between ourselves. Yeah. So, the, the, so, Sarah? Yeah, the discussion we, we generally have is, you know, there are whole committees dedicated to defining what disinformation and misinformation are. I, I spent half my life avoiding being on those committees. So generally what we do is we just say, okay, here's a working definition. There it is. Now we go do the shit we need to do. So what we've done typically is said that misinformation is false content, whether it's text or images, uh, it's information of some, some form that's false. It's not necessarily malicious. It, it might be in my grandmother not knowing what my favorite color is. Um, it's people innocently passing on stuff they don't know is false. Whereas disinformation has two parts to it. It's a sense of intent that it's deliberately put out to be false. But that also it's beyond just the content. It's the falsehood may not be in the content at all. You, you can have a disinformation campaign with completely true information. We, we've seen a lot of uh, disinformation campaigns focused on African Americans and black communities in other countries where the information presented is completely true. It's just amplified. The amplification itself is false. The groups that are set up are false. The users who are pushing out that information are false. So the falsehoods are elsewhere in the production chains. That's where I come from on disinformation, misinformation. Yaga, your turn. I, and we're similar on that. It, it, to me, it, it, and what I've always, uh, you know, the way I always define misinformation is falsehood but it is completely um unmalicious so if your mother says something wrong because she read it someplace else that's spreading misinformation disinformation is the originator of it and what their intent is so that that's where i really put it is it the disinformation is in the intent part more than anything else Whereas the misinformation, hey, I just picked it up and I keep running with it, even un until yeah. somebody tells me it's wrong. And then if I still keep running with it, n now I'm part of the problem as well. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. I, I think we actually just violently agreed. 
<laughs> We've obviously been arguing about this enough now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So now that everyone's on board, uh, essentially this information is malicious with intent and misinformation is just being wrong, um, intentionally or not. That's like, oh, what else? Well, I, let me hop in for, let me hop in one thing. Uh, one thing that mm -hmm. Sarah uh, said, I think is absolutely right. And a lot of people don't understand this. A good disinformation campaign is 95% truth. A great disinformation campaign is completely true, and I've just changed up how the context is so that it is, uh, it, you don't realize it. And you can even go verify that it's the truth, which reinforces the fact that, oh, I should believe this. I mean, really, good disinformation campaigns are just really good advertising. Yeah. Marketing methods yeah. applied. Yeah, it's, that's, that's why we use marketing models originally in the, the AMIT frameworks. That's why we fed them in. Sorry, Jim, yeah. your turn. No, I was, I was just going to say, like, um, if you look at pretty much any anyone who's put together laws of propaganda, they will almost always say, do not lie. Like, if, if you can avoid it, do not lie. And never lie by accident. You know, every like the the more truth you have, the better. So um, you know, from Goebbels saying you know, do not lie, to the uh, the British propaganda committees saying you know we will use the truth exclusively, uh, unless you know it, it's to our benefit to to not do that. Uh, even black propaganda was almost exclusively truth-based. Um, it's, it's far more powerful to give someone the truth, even if it's just a subset. That's, that's usually a, a very good way of doing it, is to just a, a partial truth is sufficient. And then as long as you frame it the right way, it can carry over literally everything you want. Um, so, I mean, yeah. yeah, like, if you think about things like cheap fakes versus deep fakes, I mean, it's you know, quite often yeah. a cheap fake. Just using a real video and messing with it is more effective <laughs> than taking the time to build something. Yeah, uh, uh, just, just to build on Ryan's point, I have written about this extensively. <laughs> um, so the, the thing I want to move on to is like right now, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but we're kind of in this... Uh, pandemic time and one of the one of the things that happens during a pandemic is my dog goes crazy and tries to break into my room <laughs> but uh the the other thing is like because pandemics are uh, on the one hand they're they're sort of starved for news and on the other hand they're full of bad news so they become a, a very fertile environment for rumors because pretty much um, you know everyone likes to feel that they know something and they can share something new with other people so it makes rumors spread very well and in a time of widespread fear there's you know a lot of space for people to come up with things that are you know they're terrifying or they sound good or so on so the thing I wanted to bring up here is how how are rumors about COVID going around? Like we we've uh, got that huge list, Sarah. <laughs> that yeah, uh, <laughs> we've got a few lists now. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, um, one one thing we've been doing is Cogset Collab have been collating all of the other lists of COVID nineteen narratives. So narratives are the stories that people tell. Um, I guess we've got to explain that bit too. So what we tend to see is campaigns. So you see these large scale events or these large scale things that are being pushed. Uh, MH19, there are lots of um, disinformation instants around that. So you see a campaign with instants within it. COVID-19, uh, there are lots of smaller instants within that. And most of the instants have some form of narrative. 
some form of story, some form of meme that they, they sit on. So, and those memes underneath that, then you see the messages, you see the fake users, you see the fake linkages, you see the fake groups, uh, all the things that you see as a, you know, I'm a data scientist, so I see as a data scientist. But if you want to start dealing with these, you need to start tracking at the narrative level. So we've been collecting up um, lists of narratives and some of them are pretty wonderfully crazy. Um, there's lots of sort of China narratives, there's lots of health narratives. Um, one of the reasons that you get these is because there are information vacuums. So where there isn't good, um, reliable information at the top in a country, or there isn't a trusted source or set of trusted sources, then the bad guys will just sit, you know, step into that, throw, throw data in. Um, either you know, geopolitical aims, money aims. Uh, let me go hunt some of these down uh, whilst we talk amongst ourselves. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, like one, one point I had is that, um, you know, like basically China and Russia have not killed anyone with disinformation, but Trump has. You know, his, um, his big thing on uh, chloroquine led to at least uh, two people ingesting um, like basically a compound meant for fish, not for human consumption. And uh, it was a husband and wife. The husband died and the wife ended up basically being in ICU saying, uh, don't trust every, anyone, not even the president, which to be fair, seems like something that you would have figured out in 2016, but you know, here we are. Um, so, you know, like, Disinformation, and I'm, I'm going to class that as disinformation rather than misinformation because I don't think he does anything that isn't malicious. Um, like disinformation can come from anywhere, and right now a lot of it is coming from the top. Like uh, it, it is coming from media sources or from companies or from um, you know politicians and that makes it particularly insidious because it's very hard to push back against. Like if it was just Twitter bots, you know, it would be easy. We could deplatform the Twitter bots. But um, when, when you have governors saying that they don't really need to do anything because they don't really believe that uh, COVID-19 is a threat, it's much, much harder to uh, counter that. Well, they've been long running pipelines as well. Um, so we've been watching for, for years now, um, stuff starting up in the chance, moving through uh, into the mainstream media and then str straight through the top levels back to back to public. So it, it's, there are whole flows here to, to be dealt with. It's not just like a simple take out the bots and you're good. Right. But I guess this is the point of our discussion really. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we we talked about uh, b before this, um, yes, there is uh, sources of disinformation, misinformation coming from, uh, say, New York Times. We talked about that, uh, mm -hmm. but like I said, where where do we expect them to step up and actually say these people are wrong? It's very hard for one entity to that's the size of New York Times to flat out say the president is wrong. Don't follow him, follow us, because it could very easily be looked at as now I'm going to be a source of misinformation or disinformation. Yeah, I mean, the politics of it is, is hard. And then yeah. you have the, and now I find the truth. I and mean, we're seeing more um, groups. So the WHO has its own list of rumors and counters and um, true facts. But um, there, there are groups that have run through, through disasters for quite a long time. So FEMA's run it way back, um, hurricane lists of rumors, uh, BuzzFeed has, has done this for a long time. Uh, now we're seeing the big orgs like WHO, we're seeing, I think Maryland just stood up uh, an information bureau. So we're starting to see that state level coming back. I don't know if we're going to get to a decent information bureau for the, 
for the US, but this isn't just a US problem. We're dealing with information vacuums and a bunch of bad guys trying to lever into those vacuums at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I was gonna say is you've, you've brought up WHO and right now they, so they, they've had a little bit of a credibility problem this year because they have made some uh, possibly honest errors, but you know, all sorts of things like where they have erased Taiwan, mm -hmm. um, you know, first ignoring, uh, ignoring the warning of human-to-human uh, -human transmission, and then the fairly famous video of the WHO representative basically pretending that they didn't hear a question about Taiwan and then you know, logging off and so on. So they, they're struggling a little bit with credibility. And I believe it was, well, for me, it was earlier today, but I think in the US it was yesterday. Trump has now started to directly attack WHO, which is going to cause, um, I, I would suspect, a like that's, that's his overt message to the, um, the various amplification channels to start generating their own, you know, what did WHO know and when did they know it? You know, how corrupt are WHO? All of these other conspiracies and so on are going to be generated out of people taking their cue from that. And it's going to have a knock-on effect just because you know, that's how the information world works. If you just, if you create enough smoke, people suspect that there must be some fire somewhere. I think so, the truth is, yeah, hmm. the truth has always been a casualty of politics, and it, it's you know political spin has existed as long as I guess we've had humans. Well, and that's why you know our our topic is, is disinformation isn't just all these other big sources, uh, and and what I try to focus on more is local disinformation, and um, a lot of what we say. Uh, at, at like local levels, take a look at, at local political campaigns, and this is across the world. Uh, what we call mudslinging are lies, but we just get into this habit of people going, "Oh, I, I understand what that is." But what it does is it makes you more susceptible to other types. You get used to that, and you just start believing it is okay to do this, or if it's your cause, your politician, your whatever. You think it is okay to do that as long as it meets your needs. But you also get societies where caveat enter holds. You don't get, I mean, where I come from, I'm, I'm obviously not American. Um, we have the Advertising Standards Association. There's actually a body set up to keep advertisers truthful. That I'm, I'm not really seeing an equivalent here. So how do you expect yeah. truthfulness to happen in a society where that isn't an expectation in the first place? Well, the problem there is Americans are really big on the First Amendment. And so, um, you know, to be fair, yes, free speech, absolutely a great thing. But that's a very broad, general, you know, principle. And when it gets down to like the nuts and bolts, and it means things like free speech means that you're allowed to lie about things. Okay, that's fair. But you know, we, we do actually have rules about stuff. Like you're not allowed to lie that, uh, you know, this mercury based drink is going to cure all of your problems. Therefore drink mercury. You know, like if, if you tried to advertise that you would be shut down very hard. Um, you know, you're, you're not allowed to sell quack medicines. You are limited in things like um, what you can claim about foods. Right? So you can't say like this is a fat free food if it's actually full of fat. Like, you know, you 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 have free speech, but there are rules. So it would be entirely possible to put rules in place that say like if you are advertising something, you know, not just that people eat, but like if you're advertising things, you're not really allowed to lie. Like you, you're only allowed to lie a little bit. Well, one of the baseline lies is this product will make you sexy. 
You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and that's the truth. And, and this, this is something, uh, not just the U.S., this is worldwide. We have become used to advertising. And that it also makes us very susceptible, uh, in my opinion, uh, to uh, these disinformation and misinformation, because every bit of advertising at a certain level is a little bit of misinformation. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing that's related to that is if you look at um, the you know, now there's a lot of companies that are being set up to do disinformation and misinformation campaign. It's been commercialized, you know, like the, it's not just the IRA, there's a whole bunch of entities. And when you look at them, you know, like they're run by PR people, they're run by ad people, you know, these, they're, they're run by the experts in, you know, marketing lies to people. Isn't that the roots of the IRA too? I mean, that started as commercial. Uh, yeah. The... <laughs> well, you yeah, definitely that's... made a point I was going to, and that's that you can take a look mm -hmm. at, at a lot of the uh, masterminds behind campaigns going on right now, and they are PR people, advertising people, uh, because they understand that's the, they understand how to get people's attention and keep it and keep it focused on their message. Well, you're, you're also talking, I mean, it's not just uh, focus on message, but you're in-group, out-grouping as well. So some of this, again, is about this narrative. Some of the narratives that people have are the stories about who you are and who you belong to, and also who you don't belong to. So a lot of the interesting campaigns have been the ones that have been creating splits and creating chaos. It's not even about getting people to believe stuff. It's just about getting them to not like the guy over there. Yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting point. And I, before we go into splitting groups, which I'd love to talk about, I just want to bring up that actually uh, a a very fascinating uh, look at how. Um, I'm sorry, I just read the line that someone put in the note that said "BJ in intensive care," and I thought that's a brilliant idea until I realized it means Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah, Prime Minister, England. Yes, is. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, I know right, what you so were thinking, it, Grog. It, it, <laughs> I think everyone does. Yeah, you can take um, the eye out of the brothel. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look. So um, one one of the fascinating things is that actually, like, the reason that Fox News and the sort of extreme right-wing media machine exists is that during the 80s there was this move of identity politics that uh, Rush Limbaugh basically started with his uh, AM talk radio show and that brought together like uh, Christians like southern racists and um, some other right-wing conservative groups and that suddenly actually created a advertising market, right? Like previously you'd have to have a, a different way of marketing to those separate groups. But now from a advertising point of view, they were all collected in one place. So they were easier to target with marketing and ads. And that created, uh, that put money into the space and therefore more people got in. There was a need for more people to do this. And most of it started out not necessarily as um, right-wing perspectives of, you know, let's, let's do deep policy analysis of how we can reduce government to improve, you know, efficiency and blah, blah, blah. It was identity politics, right? They're, they're creating like, this is our identity. And that has increased over time so it has become very much an identity statement and that's one of the reasons why there hasn't been a corresponding uh, left-wing media empire because you already have an identity as the, as the left wing you're someone who does not watch fox right you don't need to be someone who does watch another thing you simply have to be someone who doesn't watch fox so it's you know, it, it's 
again, an interesting thing about how there's in-groups and out-groups and simply having um, identifiers for that can be sufficient to uh, enable, uh, can, it can draw from disinformation and it can enable disinformation and disinformation going forward. But let's talk about splitting people up because that is awesome. Well, I, can I add on to something about that? A quick story. No, uh, in the, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm shutting you down. <laughs> no. Go in the it. early 90s, I, uh, a friend of mine and I uh, drove to work together, had, had lunch. This was over a summer. We were kind of working outside. And during the, during the uh, while we were eating lunch, we listened to Rush Limbaugh. I went the whole summer listening to Rush Limbaugh, laughing the whole time. At the end of the summer, mm -hmm. I, I was, you know, talking to him. I was like, eh, it sucks. I'm not going to listen to this because you have it on, but I'm not going to listen to this. And I go, and that's straight comedy. I, I, that's cool that they do this mm -hmm. skit on AM radio. And he goes, it's <laughs> not a skit. This is, and right then I was like, wait, this person really believes all this stuff. And he's like, yes. It, and it gets back to kind of uh, the old thing about like uh, um, Howard Stern. Why do you listen to him? Because he, cause I want to hear what he says. Why do the people who hate him listen to him? Because they want to hear what he says. And what it really hit me is, there was a long time ago, there was a, a possibility that someone that could have seen what was happening stopped it early, but we didn't. We just let everything go, and it just kept creeping up and creeping up until now. Combating it is very hard, uh, and we have to be mm -hmm. on the lookout for the next Rush Limbaugh, left or right. We, we cannot mm -hmm. allow things like that. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, a, there's... Um, Dragos said just in the chat, there's a lot of left-wing media outlets. Yeah, I mean, there's disinformation there too. They're just kind of harder Absolutely. to get thick. Uh, but, um, and the other thing is, it's not just that show. I mean, part of this is Sinclair buying up a lot of outlets. Uh, you, you know, I spent last mm -hmm. year driving all the way across America, listening to, to mm -hmm. radio stations and just hearing the same anti-left-wing stuff all over the country. It was really, really hard to find. A, I mean, I found one farm radio, one farm radio station mm. in almost every state. I, I missed North Dakota. Sorry, mm. North Dakota, but I did try <laughs> to sample everywhere. So there, yeah. there's a sense that there just isn't the variety available in a lot of places. People are getting these yeah. single channels. It, it's similar with the, um, the death of local news and the growth of national news. You know, um, people like with, with the death of the local newspaper, um, basically all the information that's left is the stuff that comes from, um, you know, like Washington, New York, LA, you know, these, these or Chicago, like these major cities that can actually support uh, a, a local newsroom that happens to be big enough to also be national. And as a result, you know, there, there isn't the local coverage that you know, uh, is actually necessary for a functioning society. Like if you don't know what's going on locally, um, you don't really know what's actually going on in the places that affect you. Yeah, so and that's the, actually one the of the energy. interesting deserts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, go, but, go ahead. Um, so I, 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 there was some interesting work on pink slime sites. So um, it was local labs. Um, so there were a set of right-wing biased um, local, in quotes, um, news sites set up all over the country, all over the US. Actually, they set up news sites. They set up sites per state. Um, they set up sites for specific topics, including health. Uh, they set up some sites mm -hmm. in different countries as well, but they, they were basically fake sites. They, they were, they looked, if you didn't know, like a local site and they just looked like a little local um, paper, but it was all syndicated, um, generated text mm -hmm. um, linked across to all of the other sites they owned. Plus uh, every so often there was a, a human putting in stuff which was either borderline mm -hmm. or had some disinformation in it. And it, it was basically astroturfing on this massive scale. And, and when I talk about going into information vacuums, that's, that's one of the things that was done, will be done. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, yeah. it's a uh, that's, it's an issue. That's interesting because um, the other thing is during uh, 2016 during the the U.S. campaign, um, you know, the the fake news that um, ended up becoming a, a catchword was primarily these sort of uh, little WordPress sites that got set up as, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, Dan the Dallas Underground Chronicle or like yeah. the Denver Mile High, you know, Gazette. <laughs> and, you know, like they, they, yeah, like they were all these small, like they, they appeared to be small local news sites. And, um, you know, they weren't because there was actually no newspaper there, but the visual trappings to make it look like a new site are you know trivial to create and once that's done it's it was easy to impersonate uh local news because yeah like local news carries things that isn't on the national news we know that so it is possible to believe that some local story hasn't been picked up elsewhere you know so it, it it helped the credibility there in appearing to be from a local news site. Um, so yeah, like that, like local news is very interesting. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, but we've, and we've talked about this before. I, I mean, you can't, or I would say a, a great disinformation campaign has to bring in that local, uh, you know, a, yes, you can, uh, yes, people will listen a little bit to stars and the president, whatever. But mm -hmm. the biggest impact is making it appear that it is your neighbor, your postman, your preacher, your whatever that is on board with this story or is relaying the story to you. It, it's so important to get that that intimate connection to make this stuff work. Uh, we're yes, starting to absolutely. see flyers again now. So we're starting to see physical flyers being put out, which is... Yeah. Interesting. It's I haven't seen that for a bit. <laughs> wow. I, I guess that's good for um, the local print communities, <laughs> businesses, and and kids who need jobs. I hope they're wearing masks when they go out and staying six feet away from each other <laughs> when they're distributing. <laughs> yeah. Um, damn. Where were we? Something about. Uh, uh, local new oh no 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 we were going to talk about splitting up groups because this is this is yeah. the cool stuff um yeah so uh like basically because i've done a huge amount of research on this like one of one of the important things about humans is that we have um tribal identities or clans like we we like to be part of groups that's primarily how we identify um, but people also have uh, multiple identities. So you might um, you might be like, I'm a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a Cubs fan. I'm a Chicagoan. I'm you know uh, X U uh, Chicago. You know, there's there's a lot of different things that can be tribal identities, but depending on where you are, you'll have a different salient identity. You'll have a, a different identity that sort of comes up and dominates. So, you know, when you're at home, probably your, you know, being a graduate of Chicago University is not your primary identity. Whereas if you go to your reunion, it would be. And if you're, you know, watching a football, whatever, baseball, what, what do Cubs do? If you're watching a sports ball, <laughs> yeah. If you're watching sports ball, then your your Cubs fan identity might become your salient identity. And here, the thing that I want to get across is that because people have a huge number of these identities, uh, an effective campaign can pick and isolate an identity that creates a tribal group that people have, and it can amplify that and create a, a salient identity, an important tribal identity out of that. And then essentially the, the most important thing to understand about tribal identities is not so much, um, you know, we are Cubs fans. It's mostly that 
we are not fans of those other guys. And um, a, a huge amount of what defines tribal is the us versus them. So you, you end up with this great ability to, to fracture social groups if you can find at least two tribal groups within that larger social groups, larger social group and reinforce one identity. So we had a really interesting thing back in 2016. Um, so I was tracking with the Canadian um, disinformation. So we were pretty early on looking at uh, disinformation coming through. And we watched um, what we think was the Russians repurpose uh, American identity campaigns and put them straight into Canada as <laughs> right-wing identity campaigns, but without actually bothering to change all of the American identity markers. <laughs> so it, was, it was hilarious. It's like eagles and you know, God and country and all the rest of it. <laughs> but it seemed to work. I mean, they adapted after a while, but it was just like, how the hell did this work? <laughs> Somehow it did. Somehow the messaging was like more stronger than the hilariousness of the hell, wrong country, dudes. <laughs> uh, hey, I, well, enough well, repetition that's... and it, it beats mm. the person down. Yeah, and the other thing is if um, a, a lot of messaging depends on how receptive people are. So if, if you're, you know, if you're neo-Nazi curious, then, you know, a, a neo-Nazi message, even if it's, you know, spelled with English spelling instead of American spelling will resonate with you more than if, you know, um, you're somewhat skeptical of, you know, the neo-Nazi messaging in general. Then you'll notice things like, not only is this a completely garbage idea, they don't even spell right. I try so, so hard not to feel that real curious. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, one, let me ask Matt something real quick. Mm. Uh, Matt, we're on till 115. Because I have seen a few questions and, and I want to make sure that we get some. Okay. Oh. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Well, as I was going to say, if there's questions, then uh, Matt, if you can like read them out. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, I actually had a, a, a question before. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you say you collected a bunch of narratives and you're focusing on narratives mainly because there's too much information out there. Uh, re regarding the, the pandemic now, uh, around how many narratives uh, have you been uh, identif uh, have you identified? Oh, God. I mean, there are dozens of narratives at the moment going on around COVID. Uh, let me look at one list. So the list coming out of uh, the Carnegie Foundation has 163 narratives. Give you an idea of that. Um, coming out of uh, EU versus Disinfo. Maybe, uh, they've maybe got, give some example narratives as well. Oh, um, I mean, is, yeah. the, is the so, WHO one of the narrative or? Uh, WHO has a narrative list as well, so yeah, yeah, their narrative yeah. list is a dozen or more. Yeah. Um, so, they, they, so like, some some narratives are like um, that the coronavirus is a bioweapon. Yeah. yeah. And then variations are it's a Chinese bioweapon, it's a CIA bioweapon, uh, it's a Russian bioweapon. It's um, an American bioweapon. I, I like the Bill Gates bio uh, theory. Yeah. He started. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> he's, it's just to promote the seven factories that he's throwing up to work on. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. And this is where we, we talk about campaigns with incidents underneath because some of these are just up and down very quickly. <laughs> so, for instance, uh, the one about Stafford Act being being uh, implemented, that happened about three weeks ago, and it just like turned up, disappeared. Um, everyone went on under stay at home, and it just wasn't useful anymore. Although we have seen flyers um, yesterday about those. So someone's trying to revive it a little, uh, just reuse. Um, and some are, are going to last longer. So, you know, all the ones about lockdown, they're, they're, they're done and gone. That, that's happened. So it's, it's playing on people's fears at the time. So 
Um, Someone in the yeah, chat is mentioning uh, 5G also. Like two people actually mentioned oh. like the 5G narrative with, uh, because that one I didn't see. No. Uh, is it like a new one or is it something that started with Huawei, for instance? Oh, 5G has been going on forever. Yeah. I mean, the UK yeah. at the moment has managed to wrap 5G with coronavirus with anti-China. So there's a whole bunch of interesting narratives going on there <laughs> around yeah. China is bad, therefore 5G is part of China, therefore 5G is bad, therefore let's burn some towers. Um, yeah, and that's but, that's part of tribal identity as well, because it's got yeah. a, you know, we're scared. Um, what's a good us versus them? And what's something we can do that's also kind of fun? And burning stuff is kind of fun. And, you know, we are not China. So that's, that's and, you know, Again, the UK happens to be pretty good on identity politics, taking Brexit, for example, you know, and the cricket test and all these other, uh, like, <laughs> if there's ever been a country that knows how to create tribal groups. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <It's> the English. <laughs> we did some very bad things. Uh, yeah. See, so uh, ask how mm. we trace back the origin of a narrative. So I guess, I guess that's mm -hmm. probably worth talking about as well. So, yes, go yeah, I mean, you, you, all you have generally, I mean, you have the top end and the bottom end. Um, so we have something called the pyramid, which is uh, at the top, we have those campaigns and then we have the incidents within the campaign. Then those incidents sit on narratives, the narratives sit on the, the artifacts, the, the messages, the users. So and the images, whatever other things we actually see online. So we'll, we'll see them. Um, we'll see things starting to bubble up. Um, you're, there are a whole bunch of really useful sites for, for, for looking for those things bubbling up. And as you see phrases, um, words starting to come through, you start tracking back those phrases, words. You, you look at um, uh, botnets that are known, look at what they're talking about. You, you look at connected actors, the ones that are starting to talk, and you track back in time. You, you track back across platforms. Um, you can't do exact phrase matching as much anymore um, because those damn smart machine learning people get in the way. Uh, so you can do things like uh, we were doing some latent Dirichlet analysis over, over the weekend, looking at what the clusters of topics were, which isn't, you're not grouping by words, you're now grouping by which things, which sets of messages are most connected to each other, and then looking at the words within those. Uh, and a lot of it is just really careful tracking. Um, you're, you're doing very, very similar things to OSINT. Uh, it, it's forensics. It's, it's a combination of applying some algorithms and doing some detailed forensics. Okay, back to you, G. Well, I was going to say, did, did you want to speak about Amit briefly? Like, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, for tools like and this, frameworks. This, yeah, I was going to say, like, because this isn't just like sort of hand wavy stuff. Um, SJ and Pablo, one of our colleagues who's not here, um, they they put in considerable time to build a framework and um, you're a life dude <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah we, we spotted this lot ahead of time so um a couple of years back i uh, started talking you'll see me at a couple of conferences maybe um hey dragos talking about the way that you can apply information security principles to misinformation disinformation campaigns and one of the things that we knew was needed was a way to share information rapidly about incidents as they emerge so we started looking at frameworks description frameworks we looked for existing misinformation description frameworks didn't find a lot uh, department of justice had something useful but um we looked at advertising frameworks we looked at psyops uh we looked at all the military stuff that existed and we looked at infosec frameworks and we looked at cyclical ones we looked at the stage-based ones the, the kill chains and we came up with a kill chain for disinformation called amit um we deliberately made it 
look very similar to the attack framework. And it's so similar that now MITRE has taken it off our hands and going to start, start managing it for us, which is yay, cool. Um, and we now have a 12 stage model. So when we see an instant emerge, we're looking from the strategic planning level. So starts with strategic planning, objective planning, through to a whole bunch of preparation steps where you're developing the people you need, you're, you're, you're finding your useful idiots, you're developing those fake accounts, you're developing the networks you need to push information through, you're developing the content you need to put on it. You, you're working out which channels you're putting it through, you're doing some micro-targeting if you want adverts, and then you start putting it out. You, you start doing um, fast leaks through things like journalists, you're doing baiting, uh, you're putting out through botnets, uh, you're putting it out en masse and you've got the physical stuff um, where you're pushing to the physical the leaflets are one um, things like t-shirts are another one but there's also things like you can use disinformation to create physical effects like um, we've seen two groups two opposing groups being given meeting protest places times and places at the same place same place and time to see if you could create a in in life in real person conflict. Uh, and then you're seeing if you can keep this running. Um, there's some M&E measure, um, effectiveness measures at the end, because you're going to, if you're running a long campaign, you want to make the next one better. So basically, that's the model we have of what the bad guys are doing. And we use that model to look at the ways to counter uh, underneath each of those, there's a set of techniques that we, we see are being used. So when we see an incident, we tag the techniques we've seen, uh, we tag the um, artifacts we see in there, we tag the actors in there. So we have um, Amit is now sitting in MISP. Um, we've, we've got it in sticks. Um, so we carry it on sticks for threat intelligence. We, we have it in MISP to, to share. So we're talking to a few countries about this, um, who are trialing with us, um, us being the COGSAP collab. And it, it's how we make sense uh, and how we track what's going on. So uh, yeah, I said it was yeah. a year of our lives just getting the frameworks in place so that we could rapidly share. Because we saw this coming. We, we knew that it would reach a point where you couldn't just do this by hand. Okay, gee, back to you. I've done the sales pitch. <laughs> no, as 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 just saying, uh, I was thinking like the the two groups meeting up was actually the most successful physical event that those guys managed. But there's a lot of really fascinating stuff about that whole campaign. Like um, my my firm belief is that um, they. They, because they believed that the color revolutions were CIA events, they believed that the CIA had a capability to, you know, spontaneously create these huge protests, right? That, that somehow this was a thing that the CIA was able to do and they wanted to replicate it. Like they wanted to say, you know, we, we have the same capability that CIA has, we can create large protests and so they tried multiple times in multiple different ways to get um you know large groups of people to show up and the closest it came was that that one incident in texas and that didn't have the result that they were obviously looking for um and i think that they they failed to realize that the color protests were not organized by CIA, you know, a couple days in advance, you know, like they, they, they were not, um, they're not a CIA capability. And um, Americans are lazy as fuck, right? If, if you tell them to like, oh, and, and America is big. So if, if you want a whole bunch of people that agree with you, um, to go somewhere, the odds of them all being within, you know, easy distance of each other is actually pretty low. You know, like you could probably find a thousand people who agree with you in the U.S., but they're going to be, you know, hundreds of miles from each other. 
um, and they're not going to want to travel, you know, unless they're really, really dedicated, like uh, Star Trek fans or something. You know, they're not going to invest that much time and effort to show up somewhere. Um, my favorite anecdote, by the way, out of uh, 2016 is how uh, basically every, every physical event was tracked down to at least one local news story, except in uh, Florida, one of the things that the, the Russians had done was they had paid people via Fiverr to uh, have a truck with a cage in the back and someone dressed as Hillary in an orange jumpsuit, right? Um, you know, like locked up in the back of this cage in a truck. And they couldn't figure out which of three trucks with cages and Hillary's in orange jumpsuits was the one that was organized by the Russians and which of the other two were organized by locals. And I, I think that that says a lot about just how much um, you know, othering has been done about the disinformation campaign and the misinformation campaigns that were happening, where a lot gets blamed on Russia. But if you look at this, you know, like they can't even tell which of these, you know, uh, anti Hillary locker up props was the Russian one and which of the other and which was indigenous. You know, there's a huge amount that was actually local and it's very, very hard to blame it on uh, an external group, even though it's much, um, it feels better to do that than to admit that, you know, um, the disinformation is coming from inside the house. So that was the comment I had on that because you reminded me of the, uh, the funny thing. Cool. Uh, I, I did. I have, I have a quick question, actually, uh, regarding the framework and the tools, you know, uh, because, you know, like there is, we talk a lot about the disinformation and misinformation, but also online, there's something I haven't seen like people covering much is uh, uh, more uh, regarding like radicalization and, uh, you know, like online extremism, uh, like how would that register under like disinformation and misinformation? Because even if you look at the data, I will take like Facebook and Twitter as an example, because so far they're only, the only one releasing like uh, like official like uh, reports. Um, obviously like Facebook is not releasing much details. Uh, tw Twitter is doing a bit of effort without uh, giving much uh, context, but for like radicalization is like Amit something that could be applied? And have you seen like people doing uh, work around it? Mm -hmm. We, we certainly yeah. looked at radicalization as part of the development of uh, AMIT, and we think you can. Um, we included sales funnels. So it turns out the sales funnels are actually really useful for modeling radicalization. You, you have the same um, people become aware, people become part of, then become uh, transmitters of an idea. Whether that idea is this product is wonderful or this right wing idea is great. So um, yeah, I and mean, we, we built it so it could be used for that. And we're linking up with the group that's handling um, some radicalization too. So we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll give, give, give us a week, see how we're doing. <laughs> okay, okay. Thing, things are moving fast right now. We, we were planning to spend this year building up the tool chain and we're now developing as we use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, different roadmap. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> well, on the plus side, everyone's got more time at home, so you know. Oh yeah. We can focus on that. Um, well, or less time if you have kids, you know, like. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have kids and you're in a CTI league and you want to come play in disinformation, I'm I'm there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, I'm going to segue very badly because we were talking about physical things. I want to bring up the um, the sort of uh, the power plays like this, the geopolitical uh, soft power moves that are going on now with COVID because they're very interesting. And I'm, I'm not seeing analysis on them in the media. It's just more of a, a flat reporting of what's going on. So here I'm talking about things like um, Russia sending military trucks into Italy 
to um, you know help disinfect um, uh, China, donating uh, PPE and medical equipment um, to you know uh, like uh, the 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 well, initially it was Italy, but like I think the biggest one was when um, Cuomo came out and literally said, you know, like thank you to Jack Ma and you know uh, Consul Wong and so on for helping us get um, masks and PPE and these things where uh, you know Russia and China are using aid to appear um, benevolent. And I mean, you know, yes, they are in at least one way being benevolent, but, um, you know, it's, it's not pure altruism. It's this sort of soft power play is the sort of thing that you would expect from the US, right? Like when the Ebola crisis happened, um, there wasn't, you know, Russia sending military trucks to disinfect African villages and China sending plane loads of supplies. It was the U.S. that did that. And now the U.S. is literally having um, China send supplies directly to, you know, the, the states, like individual states. And to me, it's absolutely amazing that these countries are able to exercise soft power inside the U.S. Does anyone have any comments? Hmm. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if there, there's a vacuum now and somebody is going to fill it. I, I mean, we're looking at a world, I mean, but what I do in my, the rest of my time is things like map, um, what happens if all the borders close and everyone stops sending food to each other. You know, who's suddenly going to be starving? And we're about to hit a world where COVID-19 is going to hit some countries a lot worse than others. Um, if you think about it, you know, 50% 50, 50 or 20% means a 10% population being, being a, not to put a finer point on it, the projections for Haiti are 800,000 dead out of 11 million and repeat that around the world. And you've got yourself mm -hmm. a Cold War style race between countries to gain ground and support. Uh, and that's already happening, but it's, it's happening in places we would never have dreamed. No, Italy, Italy forgot. <laughs> you know, NATO country, Europe, what the hell? <laughs> okay, like, let, let's be fair. So First World War, Italy was with the British. Right. Second World War, they were with the Germans. So Third World War, it's fair enough that they should be with the Russians this time. <laughs> well, don't. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had them the other two world wars. <laughs> We've done our bit. Someone else is stuck with them now. <laughs> well, in, in the, the other day, I, I, you know, yes, like Haiti will be bad. We talk about these countries that are going to be hit. I keep waiting for the ball to drop in India. And yeah. India's looked very much inside so far, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot, a lot of displaced people. I mean, a lot of well, food a, that a, didn't make it. Yeah, a, a large population on top of each other, bad health care, and then but that it, if that happens, talk about being able to shift world power, I, I mean, Russia or China being right there and being able to not now not just, uh, you know, uh, really influence uh, places with their soft power. Um, so it can be scary. Not just soft power. Um, I mean, at some point, we'll probably end up in proxy yeah. wars. Well, yeah. yeah. And one one of the, the scary things about the, um, the dynamic between India and China is that the Indians do like basically their their entire um, espionage effort has been focused on Pakistan and things like that, and not on China. So they do not actually know what Chinese thinking is. They they don't have insights uh, from human sources that say, okay, yes, they're doing the saber rattling, but really, 
you know, it's just for the internal market, you could ignore it. Right. They, they don't have those sources, so they don't have that insight. So they're kind of flying blind. They're in the same bucket as, you know, uh, the rest of the public. So um, that, that has a very, very bad potential to go very badly wrong simply because they lack visibility. Um, I'm not sure the other way around. I think China probably has quite good visibility on India. Um, at least, you know, like they've definitely hacked the shit out of them. <laughs> well, I've been pretty impressed by their intelligence gathering, yeah. But Oh, yeah. Some oh, of this uh, is, you know, some countries play the long game much, much longer than others. Mm. <laughs> Uh, uh, but but some some countries yeah. are really good on the, the 24 hour cycle, you know, <laughs> like the US. They're they're excellent on that uh, immediate 24 hour can't see past, you know. Um, well, you know, the Brits have a saying: but, a week is a long time in politics. You know, it's <laughs> depends on your scales. This is true. Depends on your plans. Depends on what you actually want to do geopolitically, and also on you mm -hmm. know whether. Geopolitics is going to be the same. Now it's been territory yeah. based. Now is it moving to to human based, be personhood based? Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm. Well, you've got um, geopolitics. Uh, you've got power. You've got money. The, the usual motivations. So. Um, yeah. Not sure. I think it depends yeah. on where you yeah. look. You know, um, like it, it varies by country, and uh, it also varies by topic. So it depends, and you know, it varies by time. So when elections come up, obviously political disinformation campaigns ramp up a lot more than sort of in a lull when there's opportunities for, for other things. Um, but entrepreneurs are going to sit on back of it. Um, so they're going to make yeah. money either running campaigns for other people or running their own sites. Anti-vax, I mean, they make a lot of money. Oh. So, you know, you've got advertising, you've got merchandise, you've got, yeah. 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 Mm hmm Um, so there's a suspicion that Trump has a financial interest, um, which is why he keeps pushing it. Uh, like that does appear to be true uh, in a literal sense, but um, I, I, suspo I support the theory that someone else put out that he's literally just looking for a miracle cure to make this be over. Like he, it's not so much that he expects to make money out of it. Um, he just wants something to make this go away because he's got nothing else um, that he can figure out what to do. So I, I think that there's that. The other thing is that um, it, it's, it came from, again, an information vacuum where basically in China they were trying literally everything and you know, these weren't randomized trials. These were people who were desperate and they'd say, okay, well, we gave a whole bunch of different drugs to a bunch of different people and some of them survived. Here are the things that we gave to people and people sort of latched onto different ones. I mean, uh, here in Thailand for a while, they were saying that um, these uh, like uh, HIV cocktail drugs were effective and it just, it wasn't necessarily that HIV cocktail drugs are effective. It's just they were throwing, you know, spaghetti at the wall. This was something that they tried and the person recovered. So, you know, that's one data point. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it's driven by finances so much as it is by fear. 
Like people are just desperate for something that will make this go away quickly. Um, that's my suspicion. And uh, I, I do want to point out, I, I think it was either this morning or, or yesterday that as much as he's pushing that, uh, a doctor, uh, I believe it is at the Mayo Clinic, sorry if I don't remember exactly correctly, was like, hey, but don't forget there are side effects to this drug. We need to be talking about that just as much. And it is amazing how it seemed like that story went and then just got shut down. So I think we're on to our last points, aren't we, um, Matt? Yep. So, yeah. So, so yeah, which so, mentioned uh, um, the point of uh, the, uh, the kill chain? Oh, yeah. I mean, basically that it, it's not just about taking down the bots. Um, we have the kill chain and we're building out counters across the whole of the kill chain. It, it, it's a lot more that we can actually do about disinformation campaigns than you think. And uh, re regarding that yeah. point, you know, because uh, and I guess also one of the problem with that, the reason people think it's just like bots and uh, Facebook and Twitter is also because they, they are the only one publishing some like uh, reports. I mean, if we can call them reports, even like Twitter recently for this month and last month, they just posted some tweets. They are not even writing blog posts anymore, uh, which is uh, a bit surprising. Uh, do you think like even like those companies are like even prepared internally because it seems like there is also some blind spots if it's non-English content also like it seems like there is a huge focus on English content and it sounds like even their team uh, well I'm gonna take like Twitter and Facebook as example uh, again for like uh, uh, companies because they're the only one trying to do stuff but even uh, with them it sounds like their team are very small and they don't even have the uh, I don't know, like people speaking like more language than uh, than uh, than English. Uh, I remember like uh, Greg, like a few years back we, when we talked about uh, Myanmar, it was a big uh, problem uh, mm -hmm. for for Facebook. And I think when, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, one of the main problem is that uh, if it was not in English, uh, a bit like the 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 the, the French uh, police when there is terrorist attack, if it's not uh, written in French, uh, like people get lost. Like, do you see any like uh, any like strategy like from a social media company or even like news company about like being able to analyze uh, non-English content? Because obviously, data and aggregation is very important mm -hmm. because that allows us to make uh, like some proper like uh, like uh, t you know uh, percentage on different uh, things and statistics. But what about non-English content uh, for for that point? It's not just non-English, so, it's also you have mm -hmm. to localize. Um, so yeah. I was working at GDI last year mm -hmm. and I was looking at disinformation in Kenya. I, I used to be a data director for a Kenyan company. So I had some idea of the data landscape there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have people who live there, they can't tell you what the disinformation is. They can't yeah. tell you what is normal information there. Yeah. So it, it becomes a lot harder if you don't have local people. Yeah. I mean, WhatsApp, I guess, is a good example because a lot of like local news get shared on, on WhatsApp. And uh, the, the best that uh, Facebook was able to do is to limit like the number of time you can forward the message. And they're doing that only because of the pandemic. And it took them, uh, I don't know, many years because we know that they, was a they, problem. They've done that in elections they, in some of the South American countries yeah. before. It, it's not and, the first uh, time. They, they also do that. Sorry. Yeah. And they, they also did that in India. Um, so it's country when, specific. When were, um, yeah, like the the Indian one they did because there were like race riots and people were getting killed. So, um, like that became important because they didn't want to be held liable for people dying, which incidentally is going to happen to Fox News because of all the disinformation they put out about COVID. There's been at least one person who has died who believed that the virus was a hoax. So uh, Fox is lawyering up and they're kind of scared of being sued for causing people to die because they were lying, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, in terms of language, I can say that basically the, the only thing I've seen aside from English is uh, a lot of these places hired Russian speakers because they figured that having uh, Russian speakers would be good 
for understanding what was happening with you know IRA um, and uh, Russian-based disinformation campaigns, and then they found out that it's not really that useful. I mean, like it's it's great, but you know that's not where most of the disinformation comes from. So I've seen that there are now a fair, a fair number of these people looking at disinformation campaigns in um, that are you know in the Russian language. But you know, to be fair, literally everywhere that um, speaks Russian as at least a second language, they're pretty comfortable handling disinformation. Now, they, they, they have a fairly long history of dealing with disinformation. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not looking for Americans to tell them that there's a bunch of Twitter bots promoting something. You know, these people live through Pravda. They're good. <laughs> Yeah, also like uh, I don't think we've seen much uh, online report about uh, India disinformation campaigns, like uh, like Twitter data sets that are like country specific that they never release once about India. Uh, if you want yeah. India, you're the outrageous person to track. Sorry. If you want India disinformation, wrong rage is a good person to track. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I know there is a bunch of them uh, mm. like uh, that are active. I'm just surprised and so that social media companies are not uh, doing anything for that, you know? Uh, so I, I actually yeah. want to stop us there for a second because I want to pull us back on topic that it isn't Facebook, it isn't Twitter. That's the important stuff. I, I, yeah, I yeah, of course. will always go back that it is the local things that are most important. Uh, and I saw somebody post in there uh, critical thinking for the win. Critical thinking is important. But guess what? A good psyoper, which I, I used to be psyop, so I still call it psyop, can take your intelligence and use it against you. You can be brilliant, and I can still trick you. So don't, mm -hmm. and part of it is that overconfidence that I'm too smart to, to fall for something, right? So emotion controls everything. And at the local level, that's where you get really emotional. Yes, at the, at the top mm -hmm. level you do, but when you're with your people, when you're with your tribe, that's when you're really emotional and you allow your your intelligence to be subverted a bit. Yeah, um, a, an excellent example of that is that um, there is a Russian-based disinformation uh, group that puts out these propaganda videos on Twitter and <laughs> and. I hate to I hate to go back to social media when we're talking about this is not social media, but these propaganda videos are targeted at groups and tribes, and um, okay, like there's now this which is not the Russian one, and they've created a sort of a visual format. You know, there's a very stark white, black, yellow. That's their visual thing. And then there's like, um, I think the Russian one is like, this is now. It's very, very similar. It's designed to confuse people looking at it. They even use the same visual cues, but they put out- I think they use the same videos. music. Yeah, like it, it looks very, very similar. Anyway, um, some of those videos have ripped through the InfoSec Twitter community you know, and we consider ourselves fairly smart, but when something shows up and you watch it and it just emotionally grabs you with basically a point of view that you agree with, right? Like um, the one I was thinking of was a police brutality thing and it, it got huge traction. And afterwards I went through and I analyzed it and I was like, oh my God, this, like, this is so flimsy and terrible. I can't imagine that anyone ever fell for it, but all of us did. So uh, that's the thing is it's, it's not about being smart. Um, all of this stuff is emotional and I'm getting told I have to shut up. <laughs> and then, I mean, no, but uh, we, we're going to have to wrap up, uh, I guess, soon. Like if there is any like conclusion points or anything like you, 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 want, you want to close on? Uh, no, no, I guess now is the time. I don't see more questions from the chat either. Uh, um, just, just, 
yeah, just the same stuff we started out with. It's that like uh, social media is a, a distribution channel. It's not the end all and be all of disinformation. Um, all of this anti-disinformation stuff that's that's going on, um, a lot of it that's just focused on taking down bots and things like that, it's, it's missing the important stuff. And you can learn more about the important stuff by looking at Dammit. And uh, I believe we're putting out a counters document mm -hmm. at some point. Um, yeah. And you'll see that it's, you know, like there's a lot of stages in that kill chain that are much more effective. And um, it would be good to go after those, not the, the final end target, just the, the messaging bit. So, um, yeah, wrapping up, that's it, you know, like disinformation is everywhere and, and it's not limited too. to social media. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, uh, thanks to uh, all of you and thanks for your time. Uh, we're getting some positive feedback in, uh, in the chat. Uh, so I'm sure it was uh, really uh, informative for a lot of people. Uh, it's going to be recorded, so that, that's good. Uh, any other points you want to uh, close on, uh, Brian, Sarah? No, good. No. I'm good. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks uh, for joining us today. And, uh, yeah, it, it, thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. Bye.